All right, this is disaster recovery for Linux and AIX on IBM Power 8. My name is David Huffman. I'm with Storix Software. So who are Storix? Well, we've been around since 1999. We're the trusted expert in Linux and Unix backup and recovery solutions worldwide. Um, you might recognize some of the logos there. We were also the providers of the first disaster recovery solution for Linux on IBM Power back in 2004. Now, we originally started out as an AIX company, so we've been doing AIX since 1999, so we've been at this for quite some time. We are also the first providers of a disaster recovery solution for Linux on IBM Power 8, Little Indian. Okay, so we also support both Big Indian and Little Indian for Linux. So for our su supported operating systems, for AIX, we support everything from AIX 5.1, believe it or not, all the way up to the latest AIX 7.2. And as for Linux, uh, Linux is a bit mixed up because some things are big Indian, some things are little Indian, but it's particularly your Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, both through 5 through 7, SUSE Linux Enterprise from 10 to 12, and then we also, that it does include SUSE Linux Enterprise Server for SAP applications um, or for your HANA, HANA installs on Linux as well as Ubuntu 1404 and 1604 long-term support. So I'm not going to read all of this text, but I really quickly wanted to go over two metrics that are used in your disaster recovery planning. One of them is your recovery time objective, the RTO. And that means how long does it take to get that server back up? So when you have a mission critical server and you need to get back up in time, how long does that actually take? And then if you add up all of your servers for your entire data center, that's your maximum tolerable downtime. Um, that's essentially how long can those mission critical systems be down before the business is critically impacted, okay? So what you do is you basically take your recovery time objectives, you add them up, and hopefully it meets your maximum tolerable downtime. And so how do you reduce that recovery time objective or that RTO? Well, one way of doing that is actually backing up not only the data on the system, but also backing up the operating system itself. And so that's where it gives you the capability of what people have termed as a bare metal recovery. Now, that can be both physical and virtual. It doesn't have to be a physical system to be called bare metal in a sense. Um, and so well, why would this help you? Well, because if you have to go in and reinstall the operating system, it's very time consuming and it can be prone to mistakes. Now, a lot of system administrators will stop me right there and say, well, I have a provisioning script, I'm using NIM, I've got this going on or that going on. And they can typically provision out a system fairly quickly, okay? But we're not actually talking about installing the image, you know, the system from a golden image or from the installed DVDs. What we're talking about is actually getting the system back the way it was just prior to the failure. See, as the system goes into production, the longer it's in production, a delta gets created between the way the system was originally and the way it was, let's say, at the time of failure. Because you've done you know, security patches, um, maybe some performance tuning, other application updates, you've installed additional applications, um, or you've made certain modifications to a lot of different files. And so once you've actually customized that system or as the system goes along, those are the things that you have to redo, and that's the part that's time-consuming and prone to mistakes because, frankly, you may not be aware of everything that's been done to that system because maybe there were other sysadmins involved, maybe you got inherited this system, or you know, maybe a third-party vendor actually provided the system with it already installed. And so you may not know what things had to be done to actually get that system perform, you know, up to production-ready status. Now, the Unix world has known about this for some time. Um, you know, Flash Archive was on Solaris, HPUX has Ignite, and AIX has Makes This Beat. Now, we do back up both AIX and Linux here, so well, what's wrong with a Makes This Beat? Why not just use that? Well, Makes This Beat is, is a good tool. It provides sysadmins with assurance of a BMR solution, provisioning tool, a way to roll things back, but it is just a script. And so you're going to have to manage everything that goes with it. You take your Makes SB, you have to find a way to get it to a NIM server. You have to set up a separate NIM server, to be honest. I mean, start with that. You've got to set up the NIM server, and then you're going to have to do all this configuration. You've got to do all the management. You're going to have to write a bunch of scripts around it. And so really, you're having to piece together 
um, a, quite a bit to actually come up with a solution here. Makes us be is not really a solution. It makes us be is a component, and you're going to have to create the rest of the solution yourself. So writing a bunch of shell scripts, setting up NIM, creating your own cron jobs, and by the way, a makes us be only includes root VG. So for everything else, you're going to have to do other save VGs to get all the rest of the volume groups. Okay, so there's quite a bit of limitations there. Now, what about for Linux? What about Linux's makes us be? Now, I like to throw in this, this slide in here, you know, just to kind of laugh about it a little bit. But for real, um, you know, more seriously, what does Red Hat say about it? So Red Hat is saying, well, if the installation process is relatively easy and if the application of bug fixes and customizations are well documented and easily reproducible, reinstalling the operating system may be a viable option. Okay, well, so Linux doesn't have a makes us be command. It comes with the system. What you're left with is, you know, either some rudimentary tools, or you're going to have to, you know, your own tar and CPIO and different things you're going to have to piece together. Um, and so you really don't have that capability on Linux. And so that's where we come into play. Uh, Storix System Backup Administrator, or SB Admin. And now first and foremost, we're a backup product. We're going to back up all your data. But we're all going to be able to, also going to be able to back up the operating system as well. So for AIX, we're talking about backing up not only root VG, but also all your data VGs as well. And for Linux, we can also back up the entire system, giving you the capability to recover that to bare metal or physical to virtual, and we'll kind of get into that. Now, how we do this process, it is not a disk image. It is using a process called Adaptable System Recovery, or ASR. And we're going to go into depth about what is ASR. Now, the software is essentially managed from one system. It's very scalable. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then when you're writing your backups, you know, you don't have to worry about coming up with some script to copy it over to some other system. We handle all of that within our own software. So you can write your backups locally. You can write them remotely over to multiple backup servers. And we even have capabilities for what's called off-site vaulting. Now, we support Linux on Intel, Linux on Power. That's both Big Indian and Little Indian. AIX, as well as Solaris. And we have additional features, such as our AES encryption. And we integrate with Tivoli Storage Manager, or Spectrum Protect, as it's now being called. And when you manage it, it's more than just, again, more than just some command line utility. We have a graphical user interface. We have a web-based interface. But if you are more comfortable, you can do most everything from the command line as well. So first, let's talk a little bit about centralized backup management. How is this software managed, or what makes it different? Well, first I want to talk about what most people are familiar with. When they think of a backup product, they think about this type of scenario, where you're able to back up your systems to a backup server. Okay, now that centralized backup server is your management interface. Most likely that's where you store your backups. And if it does have any boot capabilities, that'll also be your boot server. Oftentimes, you know, maybe this is your kind of your NIM server set up in some ways. Well, this seems very simple and easy to manage, but one of the problems with this is it doesn't scale very well. Because what if some of these clients are in different subnets, maybe on different VLANs, or they're geographically separated from each other. So now you don't, you're having to drag this data either across the WAN or you're having to set up multiple copies and manage multiple backup servers. Okay. So Storage has taken a little different approach. We still want to be able to manage everything from a single pane of glass, but you want to be able to write your backups to multiple locations. So with Storage, you can be writing some clients to one backup server, some to another backup server, which is really just the storage, but again, managing everything from a centralized administrator. So with this, you have the capability of scaling up to even managing multiple data centers. So you can stage a backup server that is really just with the agent installed that has storage or a tape drive or tape library attached. You can do that as well. And you can write your clients in maybe one data center to a locally, um, a local backup server. Um, clients in a different data center running to another backup server, but again, managing everything from that single pane of glass, maybe even at a completely different location. We also have capabilities. Because you have the ability for having multiple backup servers, well, why not stage a backup server at your off-site location? And so what you can do is, is you're writing your backups locally to your local production backup server. Those backups can automatically get copied to the off-site location, 
And then in the event of a failure, your backups are already sitting at the off-site location, and you can immediately start recovering your systems. And then in the event of a real production site recovery, you just reverse the process and be able to put your systems back. Now, a production site recovery, if you've ever had to do this, it's, it's a pretty interesting case because, you know, you may have had you know, a mixture of Power 7, Power 8 um, in your environment, but, you know, when you go to buy systems now, you know, you don't want to be scouring eBay because you got to find the exact same hardware, exact same disk geometry or whatever you had before. Um, you know, you want to be able to get everything back the way it was. Well, one way to do that is with our process, our adaptable system recovery process, you can restore to dissimilar storage and dissimilar hardware. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So adaptable system recovery. Well, when most people think of a system backup or a system image, they're thinking of a disk image. Now, what is a disk image? A disk image is really just copying off the raw bits of the drive off to a file, okay? So that way you're capturing the entire disk into a file, basically. Now, so we'll use this analogy here. It's like a brick of data, a binary brick of data. Now, with this brick of data, you've got everything, but that also includes empty space. And so, you know, you can't just selectively choose, well, I just want the operating system or I just want root VG. It's kind of an all or nothing type thing as well as you can't go into this brick and restore individual files. Let's say I just need a directory. Well, you're going to have to be backing up your system using some other product for that because you can't go in and get like an individual you know, directory out of it. That's what a disk image is. Well, that's what Storix does not do. Okay? Our backups are file-based, and so our adaptable system recovery process allows you to selectively choose what you want to back up, and it also gives you the capability of restoring individual files. Oh, and by the way, when you go to restore that brick of data, guess what? You're limited to only restoring it exactly the way it was on the exact same hardware, exact same disk geometry, because there's no intelligence built into that disk image. There's no way to make any changes. Whereas our process is much more fluid because it is file-based. Again, we can go in and restore individual files. We can selectively choose to exclude data we don't want on this backup. And at time of recovery, well, now we can restore onto dissimilar storage or dissimilar hardware. So just to kind of recap there, let's say your production site, you've got your Power 8 system sitting there, and at the recovery site, well, maybe you want to use Power 6. You know, Power 8 systems are great, but they're also rather expensive. And so, you know, would you want to have the added cost at the recovery site to actually have to have the exact same hardware? Or if you're contacting, contracting through, let's say, SunGuard, you know, they're going to charge you a premium for maybe the latest, greatest new hardware. But if you can limp along maybe on Power 6 hardware, because our software will allow you to restore those versions of the OS onto the other hardware. Now, it's the same thing goes for our Linux on Power as well as Linux on Intel. So let's say you had HP servers at your production site, you could restore them onto Dell servers or even VMware, you know, or virtual environments. In fact, um, virtual environments, we're actually seeing that on our Intel space. Um, we see a lot of people who are migrating, let's say, from VMware to KVM-based solutions or OpenStack, that sort of thing. So again, physical to virtual projects that you're doing, let's say for your Intel Linux, you know, the software can handle that because it can restore to, like I said, dissimilar hardware and dissimilar storage. So enough talk. Let's go ahead and do our demo here. I want to kind of go over what we're going to do. First, now I've taken the liberty of installing the software. I just installed the agents on a couple of systems and installed the administrator agent on one of the systems. Actually, the agent's the same. It's just what you choose during the install process, what license it'll be. But we've got kind of a blank slate, so we need to configure our clients and our servers, kind of add them to our environment. We're going to create and run a backup job. Then we're going to create our bootable media, and we're going to do network boot today. Now, we need bootable media because this is bare metal recovery. There is no OS where we're going. So we're going to create our network boot media. Then we're going to recover an AIX 7.2 system, and then we're going to clone an SAP HANA Celeste 11.4. So Linux on power using the SAP HANA systems here. We're going to actually clone that one, and then we're going to do a recovery of AIX. Now, 
The clone is going to be interesting because the clone, we're going to actually go from a larger disk to a smaller disk. So to show you that capability of restoring onto dissimilar storage, we're actually going to restore onto a system with less disk space than the original system. Now, we have enough disk space to hold the OS, but it is smaller than the original. Okay, so we're going to have to make some changes to the storage configuration to make it fit. I'm going to show you how easy that is to do. So let's get started. Okay, so what you have right now is we've got three uh, terminals here that I've just brought up here. One in white here is our administrator, and that host name is AIX72PWRA. Okay, so this is the AIX72 Power 8 system. This is going to be our management system. Um, and so I've already, like I said, I took the liberty of installing the software on here. So I'm going to run sbadmin as the command. Now I've exported my display over. It's an X Windows based app. And there we go. So this is the graphical user interface for the admin. But as you can see, it's, it's a blank slate right now. We haven't done anything with it. So I'm going to show you kind of how to set that up. And then over here, I've installed, um, just so you know, this is an AIX72 system. And the host name on this is Gold. And this, so this is a system that we're going to add as a client. And we're going to back it up. And like I said, I've already installed the agent on this one. And the other one is HANA PPC is the host name. And this is our Celeste for SAP applications. 11.4 PVC. So let's go ahead and just move those out of the way. I just kind of wanted to show that we brought those in. So let's go ahead and add our clients. Actually, first, before we do that, let's add our servers. Now, servers, again, remember, you know, what's the difference between a client and a server? A client is a system that's being backed up. A server is where you're storing the backup data, okay? Um, so that is different from your administrator. Your administrator is where you manage everything from. Now, your administrator could also be a backup server, but it doesn't have to be. And you can have multiple servers, meaning multiple locations, but you only have one administrator, okay? So let's go ahead and add some servers here. Now, the first one, we are going to make uh, AIX72 PWR8 is also is going to be a server. So let's go ahead and add that. Now, with a server, we can be writing to either disk storage or we could be writing to a tape drive or tape library. So we're just registering this server. Okay. Now, under devices here, we've got some directories. These are just some default directories that the software is setting up. You could change that or not use any of these. You can make these directories anything you want. We also have a directory here to write our CD-ROM or network boot images. Let's go ahead and save that. Okay. Now, as you can see, we've added a server here. The little green icon is letting me know I have network connectivity, and the A is letting me know that this is an AIX system. Now, one other type of storage that I didn't mention is you can also write your backups to NFS shares or, and as I mentioned, TSM servers. So we're going to go ahead and add an NFS server or an NFS share that we can write our backups to. Put in the IP address and the share. Okay, so now I have two different locations that I could be writing my backup data to. I could either be writing it to my admin here, which is an AIX system, or I could be writing it to an NFS share. All right, so now let's go ahead and add our clients. These are the systems that we're going to be backing up. One of them is Gulls. That's our 
AIX system. So let's go ahead and add that. We're going to be backing up HANA PPC. Now remember, we're going to be cloning HANA PPC. So one thing we're going to need to do is we do need to add a client or we're going to add a target in advance for, so right now I've got my goals here, it's a client, I've got HANA PPC. But we need to also, what is the host that we're going to actually be cloning HANA PPC to? So we're going to go ahead and add that. And actually, let's go ahead and add that from the command line. I'm going to show you how easy that is. Because you may have, you know, hey, i got 50, 100 clients. This will take forever, you know, going through one by one. Well, I can always do um, add it from the command line. Or I can even script things like this. And so I can go ahead and add. And the host name is going to be demo LPAR. Now, it is going to time out because that system doesn't actually exist right now. It's a powered down LPAR. Okay, so now we've added that one. So if I just refresh here, you actually get to see what it looks like when you have a client that is down here. So right now it's trying to contact MOL Park, and then it'll actually come up red. All right, so next what we want to do is we want to add a backup job. So you can see that came up. So let's go ahead and add our backup job or the job we're going to schedule. So first what we want to do is we want to give it a name. Okay, and let's say this is our weekly Linux backup, okay? And so I'm going to go ahead and write that one to our AIX backup server. And I'm going to do a full system backup. Now, there are different backup profile types. I could do a directory backup or a file system backup or a volume group backup. But the type of backup that's actually going to allow us to do a bare metal recovery, that's going to be the full system backup profile type. And I can also go in and customize that. So I have a tape drive. I could do some tape options. I could add compression if I wanted to. Uh, one thing I do want to highlight here is the retention policy. Now, one thing you don't get with a make, you know, makes us be NIM type solution or a lot of other open source solutions is how about your backup management? Um, getting rid of old backups, because as you've been writing your backups to, you know, if you write them to tape, you can always flip the tab on them to ensure they don't get overwritten. But what about on disk? As you keep writing these backups, you're either going to run out of disk space, you know, at some point you'll either run out of disk space, or if you're in there manually removing files, what if you remove the wrong file and or you remove a newer backup than an older one? And so it's kind of a mess. And so well, we're already keeping track and cataloging all of the backups that we create and having history and reporting. So why not let us handle the retention, meaning that we'll get rid of the old backups based on your criteria. So let's set a retention policy here for 30 days or three copies. And so it has to meet both of those criteria for us to be able to do this. Or to, or, so what will happen is backups that are older than 30 days and I already have three copies, those will get removed the next time I go to run this job again. So that way we don't run out of disk space. Okay. And since this is our Linux one, we're going to go ahead and back up HANA PPC. I actually could include goals in this one as well and just run all of my clients in one job. But for today's purposes, I'm going to run one of these to our backup server, and the other one's actually going to go to NFS, our, our goals as well. Now we'll go ahead and schedule that. I don't have to write a cron script around it. I can just schedule it for every Sunday at 1 a.m. And I can select where I want it to go. I'm going to go over to my shared directory. Now I could be setting up exclude lists, uh, verifying it. I could have the back, backup copied off to somewhere else if I wanted to. 
Um, for today's purposes, we're just going ahead and add to our job about creating our bootable media. And so we're going to create network boot media, and we're going to store that on AIX 7.2 Power 8. So we'll go ahead and save that. Okay. And then we've got our, let's say we're going to do a monthly level zero of our AIX system. So we're actually going to do what's called an incremental level zero, and then we can always go back and do weekly or daily incremental level ones, twos, threes, so we can either set up an incremental scheme or a differential scheme. And this, again, works more for just, just root VG. You can also, also include your data VGs as well. So we'd be back at root VG and data VG, and we can do incremental backups. So let's go ahead and set that as incremental level zero. We'll save that. And that's going to be for goals. We're going to create our boot media, the network boot media, and store that over there. And we'll just go ahead and run this one now, and let's say we, we do this one on demand. Okay, so we can make this an on-demand job. And we'll go ahead and run it, get started. Okay, so there's a notification letting us know that backup job has started. And so if we want to go in, we can look at our backup queue, and we can see that our monthly zero job is now running. And we can get more information here by looking at our status output. some highlights here. So what we're doing right now is we're creating the boot media, the network boot image. Now, why don't we just supply you with a generic rescue disk or a generic image? Well, because it may not have all the same device support that's on your backup. And so when we do a restore, as I said, we can restore to dissimilar hardware. What the limitations are there is really just your operating system. If your hardware is supported for AIX 7.2, why then we'll create our bootable media and our backup and everything is 7.2, and it will be able to migrate to that hardware. Um, so that's one thing you don't have to worry about is we're not, especially with Linux or AIX, is that if you have the hardware support involved, we will be able to migrate. No matter what it was originally using, we will be able to load the different device support doing using device detection, and we'll reconfigure the system to boot using this other drivers. Okay, whatever different drivers that are there. So this system is actually backing up, and it looks like it's only going to take a minute or so. So let's go ahead and start, close that out, and let's go ahead and start our other job. This is our weekly Linux, and we'll just go ahead and run that one. So now you can see I've got two different queues running, and in this queue here, I could be running, I'm running my weekly Linux, and let's say we were running to tape drive. Well, then, if we had this was our queue writing to a tape drive, we might have multiple jobs because we can stack onto the end of the same tape. So you can have multiple backups on one tape, and we can keep appending to the tape until it runs out, and we can even move on to the next tape if the tape, let's say, spans multiple tapes. So that's for tape technology, but it still works here with the active queues here. So we have our two different jobs. So let's look at our Linux job. look our status here. We're creating our network boot image for Linux. And that gets copied off to our boot server. So our admin today is acting as both a backup server as well as a boot server. Okay, so we're storing our backups on this AIX system as well as uh, our NFS share but we're going to use our AIX system as our boot server. So no need to set up a separate NIM server. Okay, That's one thing you can kind of get rid of is you don't need NIM, and this will work for both AIX and Linux, as well as Linux on Intel and Linux on Power. So if you have a mixed environment of AIX you know, on Power, or AIX obviously is on Power, uh, Linux on Power and Linux on Intel, even in VMware or you know, using Hyper-V or KVM or just on bare hardware, Again, we can boot those systems from, again, the same AIX system. Or our admin could be a Linux system. 
and we could be booting AIX from a Linux system. So um, our boot server could be Linux. So you can really mix and match that environment. Okay, so it's going to take just a couple minutes here. Let's go ahead and look at our queue again. Oh, our monthly zero has completed. So let's go ahead and get that started while our backup for Linux is our Linux is still going here. Okay, so what I've got is here's our AIX7 system. I've got a different console in here. And you can see I've got two volume groups here. I've got a root VG and a data VG that we backed up. And so what we want to do is we're going to actually restore this system as if we had a failure. So let's go ahead. Let's probably log me out. Yeah, let's log back in. And we're going to go to goals, which is our system. And let's just reboot that really quickly. Okay, so I'm in SMS, well, that's for Linux later on. This is our AIX system here. And so if I go into the IPL, boot P, now I've already set the IP parameters here to boot from my boot server, and I put in my client address. So I should be ready to go here. So I just need to select my boot options and boot over the network. So I'm going to select my install device. Oops. And there we go. So now I'm network booting, I'm boot peeing. This AIX system from my administrator. Oh, not yet, actually. I forgot a step. We need to enable our client for network boot. So we've already created the image, but I didn't actually enable the client yet. So let's do that first. Uh, we need to enable our client. So our clients for goals, that's the system that we're actually going to be booting. And we want to select the server we want to boot from. Select the boot image. And that's going to be our monthly zero goals, our AIX system. Put in our gateway, subnet mask. And I don't need the MAC address. Close that. I don't need the MAC address because this is AIX to AIX. Now, I will need this for my Linux system, but I don't need it for AIX. Now, let's go ahead and set our terminal type here. Go ahead and set and VT100. Okay, so now we've configured client goals to boot. Now, if you've ever had to set up NIM or set up a Jumpstart or Kickstart server, you'll see this is actually quite a bit more simple. In fact, let's go ahead and do our Linux system while we're at it. So remember, we're cloning. So we created the network boot image on our host name, HANA PPC, but we're going to be cloning that to host name Demo LPAR. So Demo LPAR is the system that we're actually going to configure from network boot. So the server we're going to boot from, again, Select the boot image we want. We want the HANA PPC one. Gateway. Subnet mask. And I do need the MAC address. So we'll put that in here. And again, I'm going to set some defaults here. I could actually even set up a no prompt install and even select the backup that I want to recover from. However, in this particular case, we're going to have to make some changes because remember, we're going to be going from one large disk to a smaller disk. So there's going to be some problems. So we're going to have to fix those. And I'll show you how easy that is to do. And so let's go ahead. I've got the 
terminal set. Let's just go ahead and save that. And as you can see, enabling a Linux client or enabling an AIX client is very, very similar. I just needed to make sure to put in the MAC address for the Linux system because we're doing what's called a broadcast boot rather than actually selecting from SMS. We're going to do that in open firmware, and I'll show you that in just a second. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and reset that. AIX system here again. Oh, go back in the SMS. Select our boot options. Select our boot device. Select our network, normal boot. And there we go. Now we're pulling packets across. So now we're booting up the AIX system. Let's go ahead and get the network boot started for Linux. Now Linux is quite a bit different. You notice that we're actually in the open firmware. Now one thing that I did want to make note of is that on more modern distributions, um, we do need to set the real base setting in open firmware to 2 million. That's kind of what it's set to. So I've done a print env real dash base, and you can see that's what it's set to for network booting. And the reason why is because we're actually booting not from a boot loader, but we're booting from a combination of the kernel and the init RD combined into one system. So we're actually burning, booting almost directly from the kernel. Now, because of that, there is no bootloader, um, you actually do need to pass some arguments at the open firmware prompt. Now, all of this is very well documented. I'm going to kind of show you that. So in our Linux system recovery guide, we go over in great depth about booting your systems and going through that. And so there is a particular set up here. It's what are the arguments that we need to pass? Okay, so we're going to pa passing some arguments at the open firmware prompt when we boot it, and these arguments are actually documented. I'm going to go ahead and just copy and paste those in. So we're going to boot the net, and then those are the arguments that we need to pass at the open firmware prompt. And as you can see now, we're pulling packets across. Now, over here, I've got our installation menus. Now, this is what's going to be similar for Linux here, so you'll see that when it comes up. Um, so what we've done is we've selected, um, you know, there's a server we booted from, but that's actually not where we're going to get our backup because, remember, when we backed up this AIX system, we actually backed it up to our NFS share. So we're going to go ahead and select where we're going to get our backup from. Now, it could be a local tape drive, local disk, a remote storage server with a disk or tape drive, you know, disk storage or tape drive, but we went to NFS. So we're going to go ahead and set our NFS settings here. Set my client IP. Gateway. So my adapter and select the share. Okay. Now I can go in and select the NFS backup. There's some backups that are sitting there. I'm going to go ahead and select our monthly zero. That was the one that we did. And I can install with current settings. So how quickly it is to actually recover that system. Remember, this is RTO, recovery time objective. Get the system back up as quickly as possible. And not only am I restoring root VG, look at this. I'm also restoring our data VG across three disks here. I've got root VG on two disks and data VG on a third disk. And so we're going to be able to just go ahead and restore that right now and get that going. Now, for Linux, 
because this is a straight restore. We're restoring onto the same hardware and everything. But I wanted to show you how quickly it was to get that process going if you were, in fact, having to recover a system in, you know, a system recovery type scenario. Now I want to clone a system. So I'm cloning it to storage that's different than the original system. So let's go over here and select our backup. Now this one was from a storage server, so it's from disk storage. It was on the shared directory. And there's our weekly Linux backup there. Now, we weren't going to be making any changes. We can install the current settings. However, we are going to have to make changes because we know that this system has smaller disks. In fact, the system, the install menus, will let us know that. Okay, It's not going to just you know, let me do something that's going to fail. It'll actually warn me and tell me what I need to do to fix it. In fact, it even offers me an option here giving me other options here. It gives me an option here to alter the partition tables. I'm going to say no because I want to do it manually so I can show you how to do it. Okay, so looking at our disks that we're going to be installing onto, originally I had SDA that was uh, 28 gigs in size roughly, and I've got a 12 gig roughly in size system now. Well, that partition table that we were going to write to this Linux system isn't going to fit. So I'm going to go in and and alter that partition table. Now I have two columns here. I have size and min size. Now min size is actually the amount of data that's in that particular file system. And I can actually reduce the size of that partition for this file system down to that minimum size because this is letting me know, hey, I can, if I've got extra space, I can always reduce that down. And in fact, in this case, we have enough space on this smaller disk to meet our operating system but it did not have enough space if I wanted the amount of empty space that I had before, those you know, larger partitions. So I'm going to go ahead and reduce the size of the partition so it'll fit. Now notice below it says free megabytes and it's a negative number. So I need to reduce these until I at least have enough space for the OS, but not so much that I'm going to over allocate. By the way, our AIX system already restored. So let's make that one 1800, and let's reduce this one down. Still going to give it some extra space. We don't want to be too close to the edge. Make it 8000. There. So I've reduced the size down, so it's still enough to meet the operating system, and it meets the disk. Okay. Now I could go in, let's just kind of show here, I could actually go in and update the logical volume management, add or change some uh, software RAID devices, change my file systems, change my swap devices, I do quite a bit into these, but I'm just giving you an idea here. So now I can, when I go to install, it actually lets me know if there are problems or not. No problems. So I can say yes. So now it's repartitioning the drive using the new size. Making your file systems, mounting them up. And now it's restoring the data. Now that's going to go fairly quickly here. So in the meantime, what I do want to do is go over here and talk briefly about support. Now, first, we have our documentation. In fact, I showed you a little bit of our recovery guides there, talking about booting that Linux on power system. Um, but we have what I really recommend is start out with our quick start guide. That's what we started out with here as far as getting some clients installed and configured and running a backup job. That quick start guide is just a couple of pages, and that's a really good place to start. And then once you're ready, you can go into a more deep dive within our user guide, and also during system recovery, get into our recovery guide. So we do have plenty of documentation with this. Um, we also offer online an online help desk where you can create tickets or respond to those tickets 24 by 7. Now, on our end, we respond to those tickets during our phone support hours, which is 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time. And then all, why Pacific time? Well, all of our development and all of our support is done here on the same campus in San Diego. So we are a San Diego-based company, and we keep everything here. And that's by design. We want to make sure that when you're 
you know, dealing with somebody within the software, if we ever need to escalate something to a developer, you don't have to worry that our support staff is in a call center 4,000 miles away. No, we keep everything, again, here on the same campus in San Diego. And we also offer emergency disaster recovery support where we have one of our techs on call 24 by 7. So that way, in the event of a system recovery and you're having issues, you would call our offices and we've got somebody on call who's going to get in touch with you and help you through that. So even if it's 2 a.m. on Christmas Day, that's okay. We do have somebody on call specifically for that purpose. And this is all included in the cost of the software and maintenance. So it's not an additional up fee for phone support, let's say like, you know, you get two incidences a year and the third one costs you more. No. This is all included, as well as the emergency disaster recovery support or the after hour support. Okay, so let's go back here and look. All right. So our Linux system has been recovered, our AIX has been recovered, but the AIX system has already been rebooted. Let's go ahead and type exit and go ahead and have our Linux system reboot. Now Linux system on power will reboot a little, a little slower here. Now, within our AIX system here, as you can see, oh, this is our, our goals system, and, VG, and this is our root VG and data VG. Everything came back the way we expected it. Over here, if we look at our clients and servers here, we see that goals is back up as to what we expect, and there's our HANA PPC, our original system. And so we'll do, we can do a side-by-side -side comparison to our demo system once it comes up, and it'll actually turn green here in just a second. We've cloned it. In fact, let's go ahead and load that other one. So here is HANA PPC. This is the original system. As you can see we had our user file system, our root file system, and you can see their sizes here, how much data was used. So we'll do our side-by-side -side comparison here. Something comes up. Now, what's interesting here is, is originally this was HANA PPC. This was that system. And remember, when we restored it, we restored it as demo LPAR. So the software had the intelligence to go in after the system was recovered and actually update the IP address and host name of the system. Now, oftentimes we get asked, how long does it take to back up a system? And that's kind of a common question. And that's actually a little bit of a, of a tough one because each system is going to be a little bit different. So in these particular cases, our backups took, you know, a couple of minutes and our recoveries only took a couple of minutes here to do. Um, and that's really for not any different than our demo purposes, just that we're running systems that are just kind of base installs. There's no nothing really added to this. Um, but I'm also on not on the fastest network and fastest disks, and so that's really the three factors. Speed of the disk, 
speed of the network, and the amount of data. And so, but in a typical production environment, you can expect to be able to recover the system or back up the system and recover it, let's say for root, just root VG, within five, 10 minutes is typical, uh, being able to back up and recover it. So, you know, let's say 20 gigs or less. Um, and then for your data VGs, depending upon, you know, the amount of data, if you're into the terabytes and so forth, if you've got fast networking and fast disks, well, then you just figure, you know, that's gonna be a lot faster, you know, depending upon your throughput. So it's not uncommon to get anywhere between 50 to, you know, 120 megs a second you know, in a production environment. Okay, so I'll go ahead and log into this system. Now, first thing to notice here is the host name has already changed and I do not have a network conflict. So the same OS just got restored over here, but the software had the intelligence to update the host name and IP address and so forth, so I don't have a network connectivity problem. So in this particular case, this is great because I could be doing this over and over and over again as a provisioning tool. So I can actually provision out an entire data center. And then if I do my same DF command here, I can see I've got all my same file systems and the, you know, but the, you know, size of these file systems is greatly reduced, okay? Um, as far, or been reduced quite a bit because remember this was a smaller disk, yet I was able to fit everything on there. I was able to change the partition table so that way it would fit. And that's the same thing goes. You could always reduce or enlarge, you know, make changes to your logical volume management. If you actually have an LVM-based system, um, you could change your logical volumes, reduce or enlarge your LVs, um, as well as partitions in this particular case. So I want to thank you very much for watching our demo today. Again, just to kind of recap of what we've done here is we took a physical, uh, I mean, two systems, our AIX-72, and did a full recovery of that one, and then cloned our Linux on power uh, Celeste for SAP applications, SAP HANA, and we've restored that one, actually cloned it, to a system with smaller disks. Just kind of highlight that. So I want to thank you very much. If you have not already, please go to our website. You can download our trial. Everything we did was with the trial today. You can download our 30-day trial and do this yourself. Well, thank you very much, and have a great rest of your day.